Hello, I'm Ben Chappell, a PhD student at Imperial College, and in this film I'm going to show you some of London's best spring wildlife. Here in the city, in the midst of so much tarmac and concrete, it's easy to feel cut off from the natural world. Between the buildings and bustling streets, it's sometimes hard to imagine there being any space for nature at all. But London is actually one of the greenest cities in the world, and especially now that winter's over, there is life everywhere you look. One of the most dramatic changes at this time of year comes as London's trees sprout fresh leaves, painting much of the city a vibrant green. London's parks are home to some truly remarkable trees. Richmond Park in the southwest is one of the city's largest green spaces and contains over 130,000 individual trees, many of which are hundreds of years old. This one, the so-called Royal Oak, is around 800 years old and was already ancient by the 1630s when Charles I created the park. It's extraordinary to think just how much has changed in London during this magnificent tree's long life. But it's not just the largest of London's parks that support some fascinating trees. One of the most familiar throughout the city is the iconic London Plain, with its characteristic flaky bark. Around half of all the planted trees in London are of this species, which is thought to be a hybrid of the American sycamore and the Oriental Plain. First discovered in the 1600s, it was widely planted throughout the city in the 18th and 19th centuries and is now the commonest London tree, lining many of the capital's best-known streets. London plains are able to thrive in these very urban surroundings because they can tolerate relatively high levels of air pollution. All trees absorb gases through tiny pores in their trunks, but in cities these often become blocked by pollutants. Plains, unlike most other trees, grow fresh bark at a rapid rate beneath the surface. This enables them to frequently shed their pollution-laden outer layer, helping them to stay healthy. This is also what gives them their distinctive mottled appearance. The ability of London's trees to absorb pollution also benefits us. Each year they remove over 2,000 tonnes of pollutants from our air. And in a city that suffers so badly with air quality, trees make a real difference to our health. But that's not all our trees do for us. Every year they intercept three and a half million cubic metres of water, helping to prevent flooding. London's trees also store over 2 million tonnes of carbon, drawing down CO2 from the atmosphere and helping to mitigate the impacts of human greenhouse gas emissions. Of course, London's trees also provide rich and varied habitats for wildlife. At this time of year, you can often hear the resonant drumming of great spotted woodpecker, especially in the early morning and late afternoon. This striking black and white bird can be found wherever there's a handful of trees, even in the very heart of the city. The equally beautiful green woodpecker mostly feeds on the ground, so doesn't like purely urban areas, but it can still be found in many inner London parks. At this time of year, they eat almost nothing but ants, which they hoover up using their astonishingly long tongues. In fact, the tongue is so long, up to a third of their entire body length, that it has to coil behind the skull, over the eyes and back into the right nostril, just to fit in the bird's head. Just a few years ago, Britain's third species, the lesser spotted woodpecker, was still a fairly regular sight in some London parks. This is a truly tiny bird, barely larger than a sparrow, but it has sadly disappeared, not just from London, but also from much of its former range. At this time of year, many birds are busy trying to attract a mate, and while woodpeckers do this by drumming, it's bird's song that dominates London's parks and wooded areas. 
and the first Sunday in May every year is International Dawn Chorus Day. But if you missed it, all is not lost. The Dawn Chorus is at its peak between late April and early June, so if you're watching this soon after it's released, then there are still a few weeks to go. The experience is best around half an hour before and after sunrise, so if you can bear the early start, then you will be well rewarded. Birds sing at this time, partly because there's less background noise and the air is stiller, allowing their songs to travel up to 20 times further than later in the day. If you do sleep through your alarm, don't worry. There is another chorus at dusk, a bit quieter, but still glorious. Try going to a wooded area in your local park and just listen, letting the cacophony of birdsong wash over you. Although it can be fun to pick out the songs of individual species, sometimes I prefer just to sit back and enjoy the whole performance. A remarkable diversity of species can be heard, even within central London. The first to begin, often while it's still dark, are robins with their sweet flowing song, followed soon after by the fruity fluting of blackbird and the rich varied phrases of the song thrush. The repetitive calls of wood pigeons, the rapid trills of the wren, and the songs of summer migrant warblers often join the chorus before sunrise, while great and blue tits, house sparrows and finches typically wait for the light. One species that seems to be present in greater numbers this year is the greenfinch. This bird has suffered a dramatic decline over the past 15 years due to a contagious disease called trichomonosis, but there is hope of a recovery. If your local park has a small reed bed or other wetland habitat, you may be lucky enough to hear reed or sedge warbler, while areas of scrub could be home to common whitethroat. This warbler is a relatively recent London colonist. It spends the winter in the Sahel region of Africa, and its population is still recovering after a series of droughts there in the 1970s. There are few wildlife spectacles in London more breathtaking than the Dawn Chorus, and whenever I experience it, I come away feeling more relaxed, refreshed and re-energised. If I'm ever having a difficult time, for whatever reason, I often find that spending time in nature, even if that just means a half-hour walk in my local park, makes a huge difference to my mental well-being. In fact, it's been shown that spending time in nature can help with mental health problems, including anxiety and depression. With green spaces dotted throughout London, this is something that everyone can access. And you certainly don't need binoculars or even any wildlife knowledge at all to experience the benefits. Now that the weather's warming up, it's also a fantastic time to look out for some of London's many species of butterfly. A wide variety of butterflies are active in spring, some of them wonderfully colourful, including brimstone, red admiral, comma, peacock, holly blue and small tortoise shell. London's butterflies are something of a hidden success story, with several species increasing their populations in recent years. From late June, look out for the striking marbled white, a recent colonist of inner London, while July and August might just reveal a white letter hair streak. This species suffered in the 1970s when Dutch elm disease destroyed many of its food plants, but the planting of disease-resistant elms in some London parks, including Vauxhall Gardens, has happily allowed them to make a comeback. Although many of London's green spaces have been protected for centuries, the city's wildlife has changed dramatically over time. Historically, a great variety of birds of prey would have been common. For example, red kites were abundant until the 16th century and may even have enjoyed some legal protection as their fondness for eating rubbish helped to keep the city streets clean. However, by the late 19th century, all breeding birds of prey were gone 
with a local naturalist writing in 1898 that it is exceedingly improbable that any of the raptorial species which formerly inhabited London, peregrine falcon, kestrel and kite, will ever return. Happily, he couldn't have been more wrong. Today, kestrels once again breed in city parks. London supports the world's second largest urban peregrine population after New York, and red kites have begun to breed around the outskirts following their reintroduction to the Chiltern Hills in the 1980s. At this time of year, kites wander more widely. Around half of all sightings in London are in spring, so now is the best time to see this beautiful bird soaring over the city. Peregrines can be seen even more regularly, with favourite breeding sites including the Tate Modern, Battersea Power Station and St Paul's Cathedral. But it's worth keeping an eye on the sky wherever you are. Just the other day, I had one come flying right overhead in Hyde Park. Even 20 years ago, there were only three pairs of peregrine in London. Now there are over 30, thriving largely off feral pigeons, but also regularly eating another recent arrival, the ring-necked parakeet. During the summer months, these colourful exotic birds can make up around a third of a London peregrine's diet. Interestingly, London's feral pigeon population has actually declined over the last couple of decades, with increased predation by peregrines a possible cause. However, it's more likely a result of changing attitudes towards the species, including the end of licensed feeding in places like Trafalgar Square. Other familiar species that appear to be declining in London include house sparrow and even blackbird, perhaps because of the remarkable rate at which private gardens are being paved over. Ground nesting birds like skylarks have almost completely disappeared from London, with just a few pairs hanging on, including in Richmond Park. Even here, they remain extremely vulnerable to disturbance from people and dogs, and it may not be long before the iconic spring song flight of this species can no longer be heard in the city. While some London birds are declining, others are doing really well. In the early 20th century, the stunning Great Crested Grebe was almost extinct in Britain, largely because of hunting for its feathers. In fact, concern for this species was part of the motivation behind the foundation of the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, the RSPB. Today, they are well protected and have colonised all the central London parks. Look out for their spectacular breeding displays in spring and for their lovely habit of letting their stripy chicks ride on their backs. Many other water birds are thriving in London including introduced species like Egyptian goose. Fifteen years ago, only six pairs were recorded across the city, but now it's a widespread and frequent sight. The Mandarin duck, originally from East Asia, is an even more exotic looking addition. Unusually for ducks, they nest in tree holes and are well established wherever there is suitable habitat. One of London's most beautiful birds also frequents these wetland habitats. It's a species many people might be surprised to see in the capital, but the only view you're likely to get is a brief flash of blue. It is, of course, the kingfisher. Any area of water with enough fish and somewhere quiet for them to nest could be home to a pair. Wait until dusk and you might just catch sight of yet another unexpected species. Most people don't even know it exists, and yet this bird is thriving in some unexpected locations. It's the adorable little owl, and it's now breeding in many of London's larger parks. Although they can sometimes be seen basking in the sun during the day, it's at dusk that they really wake up hunting insects, small mammals and birds from an inconspicuous perch. They're very vocal 
especially when they're breeding, so listen out for their whipped, almost cat-like call. London is one of the greenest cities in the world, and never more so than in spring. Whether it's London plains, butterflies, breeding birds, or the spectacular dawn chorus, I hope something in this film will have inspired you to get out and experience nature for yourself. This video is part of a series from the Grantham Institute at Imperial College London. To watch other videos or to find out more about the Grantham Institute, please see the links in the description.